Okay. Okay, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as we come to uh, the week of Ayako Pekude, this is truly a beautiful Sikh of the Rebbe. Um, beautiful Sikh of the Rebbe on this week's Pasha. I want to first of all uh, give a uh, remind everybody as we come this week is a loaded week. Uh, Shabbos we read the Pasha of Yaakov Bikude. We end the book of uh, we end the book of, of Shemois. And the book of Exodus we end next week. We start the book of Ayikra. The Shabbos is um, the Shabbos of uh, Shabbos Hachodesh. It's the Shabbos before uh, Rosh Chodesh. Nissan, which is going to be on Sunday. And um, so uh, it's important that uh, if you want the book for the, the book of Ayikra, the Sikhs of the Rebbe, the teachings of the Rebbe, and the portion which we're going to start next week, the portion of Ayikra, it's important that you call the office for the book. So you'll enjoy not only hearing the uh, Sikha, but also uh, be having the, uh, the text. So you can follow in the Sikha of the Rebbe. The Sikha of the Rebbe is, a, is, a, is one of the beautiful Sikhs of the Rebbe. The, way the Rebbe takes a, uh, a Pasuk of the uh, Pasha, and especially a Rashi in the, in, on this Pasuk, and uh, tells us something that we can all learn from the Pasha of the week, something that really is important, uh, really beautiful concept that the Rebbe takes, on the portion and really gives us all something to go away with. You know, um, it says, the Gemara says that before Mashiach comes, it's going to be a Dor Yosem. It's going to be an orphan generation. I always thought about what is the meaning to be an orphan generation. Um, and I believe that one of the meanings of the Gemara that's going to be an orphan generation is that the, that the Gemara wanted to tell us that in this generation is the obligation on all of us to become leaders. When you have an orphan generation, it means a generation that doesn't per se has, have great leaders and there are many leaders. And everybody's, everybody can jump from leader to leader. But re really the, the lesson of an orphan generation is that we all need to be leaders. We all need to learn how to be a leader and how to be somebody that stands out. As the Mishnah says, Memakim Shein Ish, where there's nobody there, Ishtadali Ish Ish, everybody's obligated to take responsibility and to, uh, to, uh, to be a leader in whatever level they are. I see there's some young kids over here to be a leader in their, uh, in their, in their schools, to be a leader in their classes, or to be a leader in their communities. It's important to be a leader. And that's what the Rebbe wanted. Lubavitch Rebbe wanted that we should all be leaders and uh, take responsibility for other people, for other Jews, to be a leader in the community. So therefore, the lesson of today, the Rebbe is going to focus on something of the Nesim of this week's portion, the Nesim who were the leaders, official, the official leaders. Uh, as every tribe had its own leader, so there were 12 Nasim, and this is important to know anyway, because starting on Sunday, we, uh, we read the, the portion of the Nasim every day, we, we talk about the Hanukkah San Nasim, the, 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 the dedication that the Nasim did when the Beis Amikdash was uh, consecrated in a month in the Rosh Chedesh Nisan. Uh, the, the Mishkan was ultimately dedicated on Rosh Chedesh Nisan, and every Nasi brought a sacrifice on his Chedesh Nisan, each tribe. The Rebbe is going to teach us a, a Rashi. He's going, to, he's going to tell us something that the Rashi says about the Nasiim uh, in connection to the Pasha and connection to the Hanukkah San Nasiim, connection to the Chedesh Nisan, which Nasiim brought each a carbon. So let's go on page 144 in the book that you have. Nasim are leaders. Every tribe had a Nasi, had a leader of the tribe. 
So there were 12 Nasim, there were 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. Okay, if you don't have the book, you can take a Chumash. And if you have the Rashi, uh, that will be fine too. So we're gonna go to uh, we're gonna go to uh, text number one, which is in Exodus chapter thirty six, verse four to number seven, and then we're gonna go to chapter thirty five, twenty three to twenty eight. By your value. So here the pasuk says um, on page four. If you have the book, page one hundred and forty four. By your kalam lechas akodesh. Then all the wise men who were doing the work for the holy came, and each one from the, his work of what they had been doing. So the Seder says this was the first uh, capital campaign where Moshe Rabbeinu went out on a capital campaign to build the Beis Hamidosh, the Mishkan, the new tabernacle. And it was a very successful campaign. The first very successful, I'm sorry, the last very successful. Because as you'll see, the Torah says that they brought a lot of money. They brought a lot of stuff. So Moshe Rabbein, they spoke to Moshe saying, the people are bringing very much. Stop bringing. More than enough for the labor of the articles that God had commanded them to do. They're bringing too much stuff. They're bringing too much. So Moshe commanded. And they announced in the camp saying, let no man or woman do any more work for the offering of the Holy. Stop bringing. So the people stopped bringing. And the work was sufficient for them for all the work to do and to leave over. Can you imagine that there was enough gold, silver, and everything that was needed? 15, 13 or 15 different articles that were brought into the Beis Hamidosh. And the Torah says, in text number two, page 145, we're going to chapter 35, verse 23. And every man who was found blue, purple, crimson wool, linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red skins, or tchashim skins, brought them. Everyone who set aside an offering of silver or copper brought them an offering for God. Whoever had acacia wood. He had in his backyard acacia wood. We're talking about a very large acacia wood. Because each plank was close to 10 amas. It was 10 amas. 15 feet or 18 feet tall. All women, all wise-hearted women who know how to spun with their hands. They knew how to spin the will. They brought spun material, blue, purple, blue, purple, crimson wool. And all the women who had to uplift them to wisdom to spun the goats here. And now we're going to the last, last of the two, last two verses. And that's where the Rashi is on. And now the Torah says, Vanisim. Now suddenly the Torah talks about the, the leaders. Vanisim. A view and the princes bought Avne Shoyam, they show them stones and the filling stones for the aphid and for the chayshin. They brought the Siam suddenly woke up, the leaders of the Jewish nation suddenly woke up and they brought the Shoam stones, which were the two stones, onyx stones, was on, on the top of the shoulders of the Kohen Gadol, which when those two stones came about the chains that held the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, and there was 12 stones on the breastplate. So they brought these, these stones, and they brought the spices and the oil for the lighting and for the anointing oil and for the incense. So these were the things that the Nesim brought, the Torah says. So there's a beautiful Rashi on that pasuk. In text number three, if you have a Chumash and a Rashi, you can look at the, the Chumash and Rashi. Chapter 35, verse 27. So Rashi says as follows. And suddenly the, the, the leaders brought. 
So now she says, Rab Nasa said, what prompted this, the princes to donate for the dedication of the altar first, while they did not donate first to the work of the Mishkan? Later on, as I said, tell you, the Chedesh Nisan, later on, when, the, when God, when the, when the Beis Hamidus was dedicated, and uh, the dedication of the altar was uh, being dedicated by Aaron and his sons, the Nesim brought right away a carbon. Each one brought a whole carbon. We mentioned every day, each one brought a whole sacrifice and bulls and, and sheep. They brought a whole, a, whole, a, whole, a whole thing. So suddenly they woke up over there and they brought right away all these sacrifices. Why over there did they bring it first? And over here, they brought everything last. So the Abnasan answers to Gemara. This is what the princess said. Let the community donate while they will, what they will donate. And whatever is missing will complete. So when it came to building the Mishkan, the Nesim, the leaders, 12 leaders said, listen, we're going to go out and make a collection. Moshe Rabbeinu gave us a job. Our job is to go and make, become collectors. We're going to go out. We're going to inspire the Jews to give money. And whatever is left, we'll fill in. What happened? There was nothing left. Everything was taken. So, so that's what happened. So the Rashi continues. Since the community completed everything, as it says, and the work was sufficient, the princess said, what are we to do? So they brought the show and stones. So this, this week continues Rashi and says as follows. Therefore, they brought donations first for the dedication of the altar. That's when it came to the Mizbeach, they, they decided to wake up and to do it first. In so much as they were lazy the first time, they did not immediately donate. The first time, the Lyceum were lazy. The leaders of the Jewish people were lazy, Rashi says. They did not immediately donate. They waited, they said, let the first the Jews donate, and then they would donate. And because they were lazy, they learned the lesson not to be lazy. A letter is missing from their name, Vanesim, is written instead of the Nesim, the Yud there. It's, it's, they, the title takes away the Yud to tell us that the Nesim were lazy. And in text number four is the Bamidbar you have over there where it says that the Nesim, what they brought. Every Nasi brought, and that's in book of numbers chapter 7 verse number 10. so the question that i've asked why does rashi call them lazy what was wrong with the nasim what was wrong with the leaders when they when they when they when they when they did the job they told the jews the, the job was to get the Jews to give money. They not only did their job, they did the job very well. They got the Jews to give so much money that they didn't have to give any more money. So what was wrong with the Nassim? What was so terrible about the Nassim that they didn't give of their own money when they got the Jews to give the money? So what was so terrible about the Nassim? Why do we call them lazy? And the question is asked even further, what was missing? Was missing the onyx stones, the stones in the breastplate and the oil. Why was that missing? Did they have to, did they have to make that? Did they make, did the Nassim make those things to bring? What is the meaning of that? What happened to that? So, the question is, the question you, that you must ask is, in a regular campaign today, 
and you make a campaign, a fundraiser, right? So how does it work with a fundraiser? The big guys, you wait, what do you do? You wait, you have to have the big guys give the big money first. That's where he goes. You get the big guys to give the big money first, the big knackers, the capable, those who have capability to give big money first, and then the rest of the people fill in, fill in the rest. But it seems like, but in a seam, they said the opposite. Let the, let the regular people give what they want to give, and we'll fill in the rest. What's, why, what's so bad about that? What's so terrible about that? Is that a, the wrong way to do? Is that per se the wrong way to do things? And yeah, I think it is. I think it is right? the wrong way. I think it's the wrong way. What if there was nothing left at the end to contribute? There was nothing left, but Hashem, they did such a phenomenal job that they got the Jewish people to give all the money. They did such a phenomenal job. Their job was to inspire the Jews to give money. They went out. They went on a capital campaign. They got the Jews to give money, and the Jews gave more money than they was needed. They did a phenomenal job. They did more than their job. So what was so terrible? The money was there. Everything was available. So what was so terrible? about them we're calling them lazy we're not calling them that they didn't they were not lazy they went out every day they were out there collecting money and they did a phenomenal job we're calling them lazy now she calls them lazy that they didn't give money to the towards the base of me to their own money they didn't need the own money the money was there everything was there money was there Everything was there. What's so terrible? Why would Rashi, why would Rashi call them lazy and say, you know what? You should have given first. What would be the difference if they gave first or second? The money was there. It was not only enough money, there was more than enough money. So the Rebbe is bothered about that concept. The Rebbe is bothered. What was the Nassim? What was the fault of the Nassim? What was the terror? I can stand if you know what? They said, you know what? Others should give, we're not going to give. They didn't say that. They said, others will give and we'll give. We won't give right now. We'll give at the end. Not that they said they're not going to give. They said the opposite. Let them go on a campaign. If they collect $100,000, need a million, I'll give, give $900,000. So what's so terrible about that? Ultimately, at the end, you're going to have the exact same amount of money. We have to find something that there was something wrong in the Nassim's attitude, which is a really a lesson to all of us. What is the meaning of being giving? What is the meaning of being there when you're supposed to give? Yeah. Well, right, 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 maybe the, the issue was that, not the money per se, that they had a low opinion of the rest of the Jews. Uh, thinking that they wouldn't give enough, and therefore there would be a shortfall. Uh -huh. Okay, but at least, uh, but 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 they would do. They would be there to back up. Yeah, they would be their self to back up. They would. They weren't gonna. They weren't gonna let the base. I mean, the Mishkan not be built. Yeah, but they why, said why would they think that? Up. Why would they think that the rest of the the Jews would not give enough money without them? They didn't know. They didn't realize that they're going to be such an inspiration in, yeah. in, in, in their job. Well, well, they assumed, they assumed. Like even Mesa Bain was shocked. It was shocked. a negative, it was, enough. it was a negative uh, sort of uh, assumption on their part, wouldn't you say? Okay, you're right. But not that they, but the question is, they were, were they lazy? They went out there every day doing their job, collecting money. That was the job Mesa Bain gave them. You have to go they there. Wanted, may, maybe they made an announcement and everybody just came anyway. They didn't, you know, spread by word of mouth. Huh? You know, who says that they went out and collected money every day? No, it says that it's, it, it, they, they would, that was their job. The Moshe Bennett called in the CMN and said, this is what the Abish to wants, go out and collect the money. Mm -hmm. So they went out and collected the money. 
Now the truth is, it didn't take him that long to collect the money. You're hundred percent right at that point. It didn't take him that long to collect the money. Because we know that Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain on Yom Kippur. He told the Jews on the 11th of, of Tishrei to build the base of Mikdash, to start collecting money. They were finished the whole job, collecting money, building the Mishkan on the 25th day of Kislev. So that means it took them two months to do the whole job. They were really excited, and this is an important part of the Sikha, they were really excited to build this Mishkan. That they collected the money, they did all the job. This was a big building to build. This was extremely delicate, very complicated thing to build. If you learn the chitas, it's not so simple to build this Mishkan. Some of the things were built out of one piece of gold, hammered out of menorah. This was not an easy thing to build. But the Jewish people did it in two and a half months. They knocked it out. They even surprised God. That God said, you know what? The Mishkan is finished at 25th day of, of Kislev. Kislev. I don't want, I don't want you to, to dedicate it till the Shchedish Nisan. That means that they finished it on the 25th day of Kislev. They didn't, they didn't put it together until the Shchedish Nisan. Tevis, Shvat, Adar, three months. So it was so fast. The Jews were so excited in the building of this Mishkan that they collected the money fast, not only the money, all the 15 parts, and they built it extremely fast. That they finished it the 25th day of Nisan, of Adar, uh, I'm sorry, 25th day of Kislev. That's two months later, two and a half months later. And the Abishta had to come up with Hanukkah to say, okay, I'll, there'll be another time in, in, that the 25th day of, of, of Kislev will be the dedication of the temple, which later the, with the with the Hashmanayim. <laughs> so it was extremely fast, extremely impressive the way they built this Mishkan and the way they put it together ASAP. But it was through the dedication of Moshe Rabbeinu and these Nesim and Betzalel, etc., who actually, this was accomplished. The truth is, the Rebbe says, the Nesim learned something from even Moshe Rabbeinu. And, and let's look what the Nesim learned from Moshe Rabbeinu. Because we don't see Moshe Rabbeinu had any arguments with the Nasim? It's Omar Abdullah, it's a Gemara later. They learned something from Moshe Rabbeinu. And what did they learn from Moshe Rabbeinu? So let's look at, let's look at the Rebbe brings down another Rashi on Moshe Rabbeinu, which is a very interesting Rashi. So we're going to go to text five, which is an exit. We're going to go back to Exodus chapter nine, 19, verse 10. And the Rebbe brings down this. This Matan Torah, the story of the giving of the Torah, and it says in, in verse in page one fifty in your book, if you have the book, God says to Moshe to go to the people, and tell them to sanctify themselves today and tomorrow. They should go and wash their clothes, go to the mikveh, and be ready for the third day. Uh, I seen it because on the third day, the Abish is coming on Mount Sinai. He gibalta some saviv and tell the people to, to, to go away from the uh, from the mountain. Bahar, be careful to go on the mountain. We negabe could say to touch the mountain. I'm gonna go to the last verse. I yaded Mesha Minahar Alam. Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain to the people. He He told them right away to go and sanctify themselves. some lace and wash your clothes. Look what Rashi says. Rashi, on on the verse, the last last verse, verse fourteen. It says, Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain to the people. Rashi says, Melame. This teaches us. Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain. He right away went to the people. He didn't go to his own affairs. 
He went straight to the people. From the, from the, from the mountain to the people. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't do nothing. He had a mission. The mission was to get the Jews ready for Matan Teda. He went straight from the mountain to the people and straight back to the mountain. That's the Rashi. You got that? That's the Rashi. Comes the Rebbe, and the Rebbe says as follows. Look on text number six, page 151. If you don't have it, listen in to the words of the Rebbe. Seemingly, we can ask, what is so exceptional about the fact that Moshe did not take care of his own deeds, needs before carrying out God's given mission to the Jewish people? What's the chiddush? What is Rashi telling us? Moshe Rabbein didn't go shopping. He didn't go home to his wife and have a dinner together. He was just in the mountain. So now he comes down. He didn't go. What does it mean? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go to his own needs. The Rebbe says, no, Rashi wants to tell us a deeper thing. Rashi wants to tell us, the answer is, not taking care of his own needs is not to go shopping. It means not only that he didn't take care of his personal material needs, but they didn't take care of the needs of his own spiritual needs. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't take care of his own spiritual needs. Thus like, thus like the Jewish people needed to prepare themselves for Matan Teda, why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu need to prepare himself for Matan Teda? Why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu prepare himself for the giving of the Torah? If the Jewish people needed to prepare himself for this unbelievable revelation, why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu need to prepare himself for this unbelievable revelation? Moshe Rabbeinu did need to prepare himself for this revelation. What Rashi is telling us, Moshe Rabbeinu had a mission. He didn't even think about his own spiritual needs. He didn't think about his own preparation. He only thought about the mission. He, God asked him to prepare the Jews. He was out to prepare the Jews. It was irrelevant to him in his own, his own personal spiritual gains. It was irrelevant to his own per personal spiritual needs. That's what Rashi wants to tell us. His spiritual preparation for receiving Torah included specifically rendering himself fit to receive the Torah made that was not important to him. So the Nassim said, wow, Moshe Rabbeinu taught them what means to be a Nasi. What means to be a Nasi? Forget about yourself. You want to be a leader? You got to forget about yourself. You got to forget about yourself. So the Nassim thought the same thing when it came to the dedication of the temple. Moshe Rabbeinu gave them a job to go out and collect money to get the Jews to give money. So they said, you know what? It's not important about our personal giving to the Mishkan. What's important is, is our job. Our job is, is to go out there and inspire the Jews to give money to the temple. That's our job. Thus, like Moshe Rabbeinu didn't care about his own personal spiritual gain and preparation. For the base, for the for the coming for the for the for the for the for the, the revelation of Mount Sinai, so too the Nesim felt was not important to them. They were irrelevant in the picture. What was important was to inspire the Jews for the dedication of this temple. Thus, like Moshe Rabbeinu, his job was to inspire the Jews for the dedication of the giving of the Torah. Are you with me? Yes. Or did I knock you out? <laughs> so that's amazing. So that's, that's, so that's what means to be leadership. What means to be a leader is to put yourself aside. Even to put yourself aside spiritually. If you want to be a leader, if you want to care about somebody else, 
and you want to, your obligation is to inspire somebody else, then you need to, then you, if you're not going to be inspired yourself, you need to put yourself aside. Very good question. So why were they lazy? That's even the question gets better. You're 100% right. So the question is, why are they called lazy? And they will soon see that we'll soon see that the Rebbe is going to come back to the to that Ashi. So why are they lazy? Very good question. But let's first understand this, and then the question why they're lazy will we'll come. We'll make a U-turn to why they're lazy. So that was the thought of the Nasim. So the thought of the Nasim was they learned from Moshe Rabbeinu that you know what, you have to put yourself aside. Not put yourself aside physically. Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain and he didn't go shopping. Or he didn't go home and have a cup of coffee. And he didn't take a nap. You know what? He's going to go up now for 40 days in the mountain. The guy needs to take a rest. No. Moshe Rabbeinu not only didn't care about himself physically, he didn't even care about himself spiritually. So that's what the Rebbe said, number seven. The Rebbe says, explaining this, the prince's first concern was to get the community to donate as much as they could. That was their agenda. They, they were out to inspire Jews. That was their job as, as leaders. To go out there, inspire the Jews to give. Only then did they start thinking about their own contribution to Michigan. And at that which point, they brought the Shreem son. Therefore, by the time they thought about their own relationship to the Mishkan, it was all done. Not only was it all done, even when they went and bought those stones, they got the stones, they got the summon, they got it, but even when they got it, they didn't get it with their own money because all the money was there already. So when they went and they acquired these onyx stones, which the Jews didn't have, they had to go out. As the Medrash says, they had to get a lot of things from other places. They had to go buy it. Simply go buy it. They had to leave the camp and go to a, 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 a whatever neighboring place near there and acquire this stuff. How did they acquire it? They acquired with the money that the Jewish people gave. They didn't have to put out their own money. That's all they did was buy the stuff. They acquired these onyx stones. They went and got the stones for the breastplate. They went and got the oil for the incense and the summon. The money was all there. And that's when text 8 it says, the Torah tells us that all the raw material necessary for the Michigan construction was donated. None of them had to purchase with contribution funds. That's it. Everything was, all the money was given. And that's why the Rebbe says in text number 9a, when we say the community completed everything and the work was sufficient, we mean this, even for the items from the 13 special materials that they did not have on hand, the Jewish people met the need by donating lots of silver, lots of gold, including the Mount Nessay to purchase the Shom stones and the filling stones. Everything was there. That's all the Nassim needed to do is buy it. Go out and buy it. The Jewish people didn't bring it. They didn't have any Shom stones for whatever reason. They didn't have any onyx stones, the stones in, in the breastplate. And the Nassim took money that was there already. And they brought they went and bought it, and they brought these stones. It was all there for them. So what was wrong? So what was wrong with the Nassim? What was so bad with the Nassim if they did a phenomenal job of inspiring the Jewish people? Rabbi? Yes. Maybe they were supposed to be an example for the people and they were not.
they were it was seeming that they, if they were inspired the Jewish people, they uh, didn't have to be such an example. It was not the fault of their example. They were phenomenal. They would have a great inspiration. They inspired the Jews for every reason. So uh, they did their job. They did their job. Something was still missing with them. They felt bad. Not the Jewish people made them feel bad. They felt bad. That's what Rashi said. Rashi said they felt bad. What did they feel bad about? They did their job. They felt lazy. Why did they feel lazy if they did their job? They felt so lazy that when it came to dedication of the Mizbeach, they were there first. What was so, why, why, why did they feel bad if they did their job? Our Nassim, is that, is that, that the same thing as a Nazir? No. No, 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 no. Nassim is a oh, leader. Nassim is a tribe? Nassim is the head of the tribe. Oh. So let's look at the Rebbe 9b. Let's go, we're coming to the Rebbe's answer to this question. The princess felt, the Rebbe says as follows. The, the page number 154. The princes felt their pride in donating to the Mishkan didn't equal up to everyone else. When everyone else donated their materials, they were really meeting the need of the Mishkan. But when the princes donated, there was no really such need because already there was enough money in the coffers to purchase the show. So princes felt that the basically, they, their dedication to the base of Mikdash even though they did a great job, was not at the dedication of the rest of the Jews. Mm. There was something lacking in the dedication. The rest of the Jews actually were part of the Mishkan and they were not. They were actually not part of this Mishkan as the rest of the Jews. They were part of the inspiration to collect it, but they were not part of the actual Mishkan. And that was their sadness. So even though they got money, they, they bought the stuff, they brought the Avnei Shoyim, but they brought it with money that was there already. So they basically felt that these 12 guys felt that there was something lacking in the Mishkan, in the actual building of this Mishkan. They were not part of the building of this Mishkan. They were part of the inspiration to build the mission, but they had no part in the actual building of the mission. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? We don't need you, Baruch Hashem. We, you're not needed. So what do you say about something where you're not needed? It emerges their role was simply to bring actual stones taken away. They needed to go out to buy them. That's all they accomplished. That's what they felt they accomplished. So really, the Rebbe is going to explain what was their, they felt bad. And nearly that's what the lesson is going to be to all of us. It's a very powerful lesson is going to be to us. What means to be there for somebody else, to be there for, 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 for a, a, an agenda, to be there for a mission, and not to think later that you were not part of the mission. Even though you inspired the mission, even though you, but you're not part of the actual mission. And that was what the Nassim felt, they were not part of the actual mission. And what does that mean? That they were not part of the actual mission of this Mishkan, of this tabernacle. And it affected them so, so much that they had a change of heart. It affected them so much that they had a change of heart. And when it came to the, the Mizbeach, they were there first. So we have to understand what the Mishkan meant to the Jews in the desert. What this Mishkan meant to the Jews in the desert. 
So you have to imagine the picture. Imagine the situation. Matan Torah, God reveals himself to the Jewish people. And 40 days later, they sin, they make a golden calf. And then Moshe Rabbeinu has to another 80 days go ask forgiveness for them. And in Kippur, God forgives them. But he puts one stipulation in the forgiveness. He puts one stipulation in the forgiveness, and that is build a Mishkan. That's the stipulation. And if you understand the stipulation in the building of Mishkan, you'll understand why the Yidden had such an excitement to build this Mishkan. Because after the golden calf, they felt so emotionally detached and so emotionally drained now, when the Abish said, if you build this Mishkan, I'll give you Kapara, why the Yidin, why the Jews in that generation had such an excitement to build this Mishkan. And that's why it was, it was the greatest ca capital campaign in history. So let's look at text number 10. Amr Yehuda ben Abshalom. Abi Yehuda ben Abshalom said, the Yom Kippur, in the name of Israel, on Yom Kippur, Moses was told, they shall make for me a sanctuary. Thus it was on Yom Kippur that the Jewish people were forgiven. And it was the, on the very day that God said, they shall make for me a sanctuary. And I'll dwell amongst them. So that the nations of the world would should see that he forgave the Jewish people for the golden calf. This is why the tabernacle is called the tabernacle, tabernacle of testimony. Because it serves as a testimony to the whole world that God dwells in the sanctuary of the Jewish people. So here the Jewish people were worried. After this whole story of the golden calf, they were anxious and afraid that God would not forgive them. And the nations of the world would see God would not, not forgive them. As Moshe Rabbeinu himself says, Lama Yerim Goyim. Why would the nations of the world say that you were not forgiving them? And here, the Abishta gives them a mitzvah to build the Mishkan, which would automatically show that he forgave them. They were so excited. They were so excited in the building of this Mishkan. As I said, they built it in two months, the building of this Mishkan, besides collecting everything and more, they built it in two months, two months and something. Then on a, on, on a Nisan, this coming Sunday, the Nisan, they built the Mishkan, took it apart every day for seven days. They built it, took it apart, 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 built it, took it apart. Seven days. You have in text number 11. Throughout Rashi, this is Rashi. Throughout all seven days of the of the in, investitures, which is preceding the inauguration, the when Moshe erected the mission, performed the service in it, and then dismantled it daily. The Shina did not rest in it. The Israelites were humiliated. They said to Moshe, Moshe, our teacher, all the efforts we have taken was so that the Shina would dwell amongst us. So that we would know that we have been forgiven for the sin of the golden calf. Therefore, Moshe answered them, My brother Aaron is more worthy and important than I. And so far, as through his offering and his service, the Shekhinah will dwell amongst you. That happened on the eighth day. And you will know that God has chosen him. And Aaron became the Kohen on the eighth day. Such was the anticipation and the excitement of the Jewish people. There's a beautiful story. I'm going to tell you a story about Baal Shem Tev. A beautiful story about Baal Shem Tev. It's a famous story. Baal Shem Tev once had a chassid. His name was Rabbi Yaakov. And the Baal Shem Tev called in once Yair Yaakov and told him, I want you to leave your job, your Panasa. And I want you to have another job. 
I'm going to give you another job. And the Chassid said, sure. And Rav Shemta said, yes, what should be my job? I want you to travel and tell stories of the Baal Shem Tov. I want you to travel around and tell stories of the Baal Shem Tov. Very interesting job. He said, when, I, when am I going to know my job is over? <laughs> he said, you'll know. The day will come, you'll know. So the Ziyad Rabbi Yankiv went and traveled place to place telling stories about Shantiv and he made money. Yeah, that, that was his parnas and he sent his money back to his family. He came once to a city and he was told that the Gavir, there was a very wealthy man in the city and he actually plays a lot of money to hear stories about Shantiv. So Rabbi Yaakov came to him before Shabbos, he came to him on Friday. And he told him that I am the master storyteller of the Baal Shem Tov. And I'm going to tell you stories of the Baal Shem Tov. I said, wow. He made a big party Friday night. And everybody came to hear this guy tell stories of the Baal Shem Tov. Came Friday night. And they asked him, OK, Abiyankiv, start telling his stories. He suddenly forgot. Couldn't remember any story of the Baal Shem Tov. So I'm sorry. Maybe I'm tired. Can't believe I can't remember a story. The guy was disappointed. Baal says, you know what? Go to sleep. Tomorrow, make a big kiddish and shul, you'll tell stories. He says, fine. Goes to sleep. Comes tomorrow. The whole shul's packed. They want to hear stories about Shem. This guy made a big kiddish. I can't remember. He says, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Maybe shall show this. Make a big shall show this. I can't remember. This, this poor rich man is getting frustrated. He says, I don't understand. I made this whole Shabbos meal and this whole thing, you know, I can't remember. Maybe Mav Malka makes a big Mav Malka after Shabbos. The guy can't remember. Like it's a Sunday morning, he's ready to leave. The guy's embarrassed. He comes, he says, I want to I want to apologize for some reason. I've been telling stories for years and years. I suddenly can't remember any stories. He says, oh, okay, fine. Let's see. I can't remember. I can't remember. Have a good life. And he walks out, he tells his always, I remember. I remember a story. The guy got so happy. He says, Okay, come sit down. Tell me the story. He says there was one time the Baal Shem Tev told us, me and a couple of group of his Talmudim to get in the carriage, we're going to travel. That's what the Baal Shem Tev did in general. Got into a carriage, and there was the famous uh, Goyish non-Jewish wagon driver, and he'd tell him to start driving, would fall asleep, and the carriage would drive. Would roll through the road, and it was that Baal Shem Tev had Baal Shem Tev stories. Akitsa, they came into a city the Sunday morning. They left much of Shabbos. They came into a city, some city they don't know where. And it was Sunday morning, and the carriage stops in front of a, in front of a house. And they knock on the door. All the, the doors are closed, and the windows are shut. And a Jew comes and opens the door. He says, what are you doing here? You're crazy. What are you doing here? He says, what's the matter? The Baal Shem Tov's here. Come, 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 come quick into the house. They come into the house. He locks the door. He says, what's the matter? Baal Shem Tov says, what's the matter? He says, oh, today the bishop, Saini Yisrael, this bishop, he's a hater of Jews. He's giving a very famous speech against Jews, and all Jews are, are Pasha petrified, and we're locked in the house. Baal Shem Tov says, come, let's daven. He starts to daven. He says, let's eat breakfast. He's eating a lot of breakfast. He calls me over, Rabbi Yankim says, he says to me, I want you to go to the church. I want you to walk up to the bishop. I want you to walk up to the bishop while he's talking and tell him that the Baal Shem Tev wants to speak to him. The guy, the owner of the house, says, you're crazy? You're going to let, you're going to go to the bishop in the church? 
and you're gonna in the middle of his speech, you're gonna tell him, he says, Yeah. Well, Shemta says, Yeah, you do that. Abyakiv says, I go, I go to the I go into the church back with Goyim, they're all screaming. I walk up to the to the to the whatever, to the pulpit over there. I I, I say, excuse me. The bishop turns around. I say, uh, um, the Baal Shem Tev wants to uh, wants to talk to you. He looks at me. He says, "Tell the Baal Shem Tev, I, I, I'll talk to him later." Goes back. Tell the Baal Shem Tev, The bishop said, "I'll talk to you later." Baal Shem Tev says, "No, go back. Tell him that the Baal Shem Tev said you got to come now." I want to talk to you right now. I get to Yaku says I went to I went to the back to the church. I went in there. He was giving, screaming his drasha, and everybody was screaming. And I went to him. I told him, my friend, I'm sorry, but the Balshemtiv wants to talk to you right now. The bishop stops his speech. Stands in front of the uh, the uh, the crowd. I'm sorry. I have to go out. He walks out, and he brings him. This guy brings him to Baal Shem Tev, and they go into a private room. And what all I know is the Baal Shem Tev and the bishop walked out. The Baal Shem Tev got back in the carriage, and went and went and went and went away. While he's telling the story. The guy in front of him, the Gavir, he's like, I'm just like turning white. He says, what's the matter? He says, I'm the bishop. I'm the bishop. And I'm very happy that you told me this story. Because Baal Shem Tev, I'm the bishop. Baal Shem Tev called me in to, my, to the room and Selvin said, he awakened my neshama, and I, uh, I, he told me, you're a child that was taken away from the uh, Jewish family, and you were brought up by, by the church, you became a bishop, but really a yid, and he woke up my neshama, and I cried, and I said, what should I do? And the Baal Shanta said, you have to do tshuva, and, you know, change your identity. And then yeah, I asked the Baal Shanta, when will I know that my tshuva was accepted? The Malshemta said, you'll know your tshuva is accepted when somebody's going to come, one of my chassidim are going to come to you and tell you this story. Then you'll know that your tshuva has been accepted. So that's why I've been paying all these years for people to tell me stories about Shemta. Because I was waiting for somebody to tell me this story. Now that you told me this story, I know that my tshuva has been accepted. I'm telling you the story of the Baal Shem Tev, which is a beautiful story of the Baal Shem Tev, but self-understood to, to realize the, the anticipation and the excitement and the anxiety of this Jew that was waiting and praying and hoping to hear this story of the Baal Shem Tev. And he paid hundreds of people to tell him stories of the Baal Shem Tev, so that one person would tell him this exact story, his own story to him, to know that he was forgiven. Imagine the Jewish people in their anticipation and excitement to the building of this Mishkan, to the building of this, this tabernacle. And that was the laziness of the Nassim. The Nassim, you're right, they were there to inspire the Jews but if they would realize the Jewish anticipation to build this Mishkan, they would have got involved in the Mishkan too. And that was their lack, the Rebbe says. If you want to be a leader, it's not that you're only there to inspire, but you're there to, to get involved. Because if you understand, the, the, you understand the excitement of the people, you understand the people you're leading, then you're not only there to inspire, you're there to get involved with them. And that was why the Nasir were lazy. They didn't realize the excitement of the Yidden. They just didn't realize how excited and how, how important the, to the Jews was the building of this Mishkan. 
that for them, it meant everything for them. For them, it meant that God forgave them. For them, it meant that God was part of their, their journey. For them, it meant that God was dwelling in their midst. And if they would have felt the people that they were leading, they wouldn't have been lazy. Not, a, not only would they inspire the Jews, they would have got involved with the Jews. And given right then and there, they would have given as the Jews were given. Not because it was needed. That's not the point. Not because it was needed or not needed. Because that's what the Jewish people needed at that time. And that was the laziness of the Jewish, of the Nassim. And therefore, the Nassim, the second this, that we came to the dedication of, of, the, of the altar, the Nassim right away gave. Because the dedication of the altar was just as exciting as the building of the Mishkan. So the Rebbe says that is the lesson to each and every one of us. We're living in a Dur Yosem. We're living in, a, in, a, in, a, in an orphan time. Each and every one of us are not there to only inspire one another, but to get involved. Get involved. We're, we're, we're in a generation that each and every one of us needs to get involved. That's the greatest inspiration that you can give to another person is by getting involved. Learn from the Nassim. Who there, they inspired people, they got the people to do everything, but they themselves, for whatever reason, didn't get involved. They were not there with the people. They didn't feel they were there with the people building the Mishkan, and they weren't. They learned from their mistakes, and we should learn from the Nassim how to get. And that's the concept of leadership, getting involved. The Rebbe writes in text number 12, and this is repeating what the Rebbe has said, true, a Jewish, a leader's job is to make sure Jewish people fulfill this responsibility. But at the same time, the princess should have taken care to build the Mishkan quickly, making sure everything needed was ready as soon as possible. Therefore, in this case, waiting around for the community to donate what they will donate and whatever they are missing will complete was out of place. Precisely because they were leaders, even as they were encouraging the Jewish people to donate as much as they could, they ought to have simultaneously hurried to bring their own gifts so that the Mishkan could be completed as soon as possible. That is the lesson. The Rebbe, the Rebbe, the, 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 last, the last text over here is the statement of the, the Rebbe. Um, <clears throat> the, this was the Mithil Rebbe. The Mithil Rebbe once told the Chassid, look, and, and, the, and then we'll end with this. Um, the Mithil Rebbe, the text number 13, page 158, the Mithil Rebbe, of David Lubavitch, second Chabad Rebbe, embarked on a campaign to teach chassidim throughout the world. To this end, he instructed all his chassidim when they would visit Lubavitch to teach chassidim publicly. In every town they would pass on their way home. One of the chassidim who would recite the chassidim's teaching noticed the positive effect his words had on his listeners. And he approached the Rebbe with a question. He had a good grasp of the material. He had a talent for teaching it to others in an impactful way. Thus, he was starting to feel proud, even somewhat egotistic about it. So he wanted to know, should he continue teaching? He didn't relate that the middle of answered him. Even if you become like an onion, you should still teach this. Really? There's too many, there's many meanings to this expression. Even if you smell like an onion, onion is sharp, doesn't make a difference. You should do your job. Even if you taste like an onion, to mean you, you, you throw it into a pot of, of thing and you give the taste of, 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 you give the sweet taste or whatever the taste you give to the food, you should continue to teach us to this. 
it's important to get involved. Whether you get, whether you, whether you're receiving any, whether you're doing it out of humility, whether you're doing it out of egotistical reasons, it doesn't make a difference. It's what's important, what the people need. The people need, this generation needs everybody's involvement. The Rebbe wanted that every person should be a leader, whether it's gonna, whether he's gonna be a leader through his humility, whether he's gonna be a leader through his own, he's gonna give him an ego right. It's gonna give him a little bit of an ego right. Doesn't make a difference. You gotta think of what the people need. Am Yisrael today needs leaders. Not leaders that stay on the sidelines, but leaders that get involved and put their time, their effort, their talent, their, 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 their capabilities in anything that you could do to help Yiddishkeit and to help another Jew. Get involved. Learn from the Nasim of this week's Pasha to get involved, don't wait, and everything will be done without you. Because ultimately, we, if not for you, if you're not going to get involved, somebody else will get involved. Doesn't make a difference if you, it's going to bring you humility. It doesn't make a difference. It's going to bring you some ego. A tzibula sells from the veteran of a chsidis or sechazim. That's the Yiddish. A army should come from you, but you should do what is right. And that's the lesson that the Rebbe learns from this beautiful Rashi about the Nasi. Let's all be leaders. Let's all not be ashamed later to say, I could have done it. I should have done it. I would have done it. Because it's going to be done anyway. Be part of it. Every one of us should be leaders, and every one of us should be part of it. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. This coming Thursday, we finish the JLI class, the Journey of the Soul, at seven thirty. And I hope to see you Shabbos. Shabbos Chodesh, Shabbos Chazak. I hope you buy the new book for Vayikra. So you'll be able to follow in the next Sikh of the Rebbe next Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. Have a beautiful day. My birthday is over already. It's already the 26th day of, 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 uh, of others, so my birthday is over. Exactly. We will be blessed. I have a happy and healthy year, wonderful year, a happy year. I bless you all. I didn't have a mind of yet, so it's still my birthday. I bless you all. <laughs> happy and wonderful. Good health and happiness and joy. In your life. God bless you all. I hope you enjoyed the Sikh of the Rebbe. Yeah. And you learned something today on the portion. Have a wonderful night. We have a job to do. Thank you, Rabbi. Get to work, Ken. Get to work. <laughs> have a wonderful birthday and a great. Thank you, Zoe. It's great to see you. Where's your beautiful wife? I don't see. She was just here. Oh, she was? Yeah. God bless you. It's great to see you. You God look bless younger. You. God bless you. You look younger. <laughs> what happened over the last year? You look. You got younger on me. Uh, I'm, I'm getting wish. older. You're getting younger. I wish. You're looking great. Good. God Thank bless you. you. Great to God see bless you. you.